So my name is Bev Lands, and I've been asked to moderate today, so bear with me. Um, I'm sure I'll need lots of nudging to make sure that I get this right, but I'll do my best. Uh, full disclosure, I am also past president at the Lethbridge and District Exhibition. So I have a little bit of vested interest in this being a successful event and um, pleased that we are able to come in and share this, share this story with you today. Um, so our, I guess I jump right into uh, introducing our speaker. Mike Workington, CEO of Lethbridge and District Exhibition. Mike. Mike joined Lethbridge and District Exhibition in 2018 as Assistant General Manager, was appointed General Operating Officer in 2019, and was named CEO in May of 2021. Workington has spent more than a decade in corporate leadership roles through his work in economic development, venue management, major events. Mike now leads a team of industry professionals as the organization prepares to open the Agri-Food Hub and Trade, Trade Center. Raised in Lethbridge, Workington earned his undergrad degree at our University of Lethbridge and holds a Master's of Business in Administration from San Diego State University, where he was named Outstanding Alumnus in 2018. As an active community member, Mike is proud to make an impact on our region. Mike. Thank you, Bev, and thanks for having me. Um, I will be, I, I may not be as entertaining as the bail system, so I apologize. Um, I'm probably more like the summer holidays that were mentioned, but thank you very much. And I do just want to get a sense, because this group is actually one of the first groups I presented this project to in, in 2018. Uh, when I first moved back here. And so I'm curious how many of you were actually at that presentation. We did it in the saddle room. At the, okay, four, five, five, six of you. Excellent. So we've gone through a little bit of change since then. Uh, sorry, I gotta do my slides here too. Sorry, Paul. All right. So as Bev said, I'm Mike Workton. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Lethbridge and District Exhibition. We are in our 126th year of operation. Um, we, we've had a lasting legacy on this community. Um, or we believe we have anyways. Lethbridge and District Exhibition started in eight, 1897, really as a, no, no different than SACPOC. A group of community leaders, ranchers and farmers coming together to create something that grew Lethbridge, showcased Lethbridge on, a, on an international scale to uh, people of the region and to people of the world. For over 100 years, as you can see, we have been a significant impact on the agricultural sector, on the event sector, and bringing this community and region together. Um, in 1912, our existing site was actually developed in conjunction with Henderson Lake to host the World Dry Farming Congress. I'm going to get these numbers off by a little bit, so bear with me, their estimates. But it's our understanding that at the time, Lethbridge had a population of about 2,500 to 3,000 people. That particular event brought over 6,000 delegates to Southern Alberta from over 20 countries to, to showcase the agriculture that existed here in southern Alberta, which ultimately led to a great influx of investment into the agricultural system here in southern Alberta, which led to the creation of the irrigation canals and ultimately the modern day agricultural regional leader that we are. And I'm exceptionally biased about it, but I'll put this region up against any production and processing region anywhere on earth. Okay. Um, and so that's the impact Lethbridge and District Exhibition can have and will have on the agricultural sector and this overall regional economy here in southern Alberta. And so what we're doing today, the collective today, uh, is we're really stepping back to those original roots of our organization and we're once again re-inviting the world to southern Alberta to see the agricultural sector that exists here in southern Alberta. Okay, sorry. 
So I hope most of you, you know, or you all do, we're in the process of building the new 268,000 square foot agri-food hub and trade center. And so what does that mean? Lots of people say, what's an agri-food hub and trade center? And ultimately it is, it will be the most state-of-the-art trade and convention center in the country when it opens a little over a month from now. So to put that, lots of people drive by, they see the windows, they wonder what's the big hole to the south? What's actually gonna happen in there? Well, um, we get possession one month from two, sorry, a month less two days from now, and then we'll be running, someone already asked me this question, so I'm gonna jump to it. We'll be running our first events in July of this year. What this facility allows us to do is it allows us, um, uh, I'll actually just get, I'll see if I can. So this picture on the right is actually of our trade halls. They're 104,000 continuous square feet. And I, I'm sure some of you have been to our events. They've seen how uh, mismatched our existing pavilions are. To put into perspective, this, this picture here, to put that into perspective, everything we have at Exhibition Park today is 114,000 square feet. So we can almost take our entire operation and put it in those four trade halls, each of which are 26,000 square feet. Not to mention the fact that we've added 13,000 square feet of convention space, we've added uh, 5,000 square feet of meeting space in four separate boardroom styles, plus we've added a marquee event space, ultimately what we believe is the premier event space in southern Alberta, and that includes the mountain parks. And so we, we now have the amenity to re-welcome the world to southern Alberta. Okay. And so I think everybody knows the impact agriculture has on the southern Alberta economies, in particular here in Lethbridge. EDL says it's 20% of the jobs here in southern Alberta are in agriculture, but I think we, we like to talk about a significantly larger percentage of the actual dollars that flow through the economy here in Lethbridge and southern Alberta um, being via agriculture, because a lot of the retail, a lot of the um, the commercial development, et cetera, is all funded by agriculture dollars or it's agricultural dollars using it. And so that's a significant impact that we have. And then the other thing that we, we also like to talk about is the amount of product that leaves Southern Alberta to go to global markets, particularly uh, in the potato, corn, canola uh, crops, and then of course our export uh, beef cattle as well. And so what we're, what our goal is and what uh, Lethbridge and District Exhibition is doing with this facility is we're not focusing on regional events anymore like we have. We will certainly do those and we will still be a community gathering place for this community to come together. But it's also about attracting new people, eyes and investment here into Southern Alberta. And so uh, when we open our doors, our sales process is actually going to be focusing on attracting provincial association events, national association events, and then we're actually just dipping our toe into bidding on international agricultural events that will bring numbers like 800 to 1500 international delegates here into southern Alberta. And so what will that mean for what we need to what we need to see the community grow like and how will that how will investment flow through what we're doing at Lethbridge and District Exhibition into the local economy. Well, we hit two limits pretty quick when we start talking about 800 to 1500 delegates. We have a ceiling on the number of hotel rooms that we have here in the market, so we'll need to see investment, we'll need to drive investment in that sector and then in, in our air traffic. And lots of people like to talk about air traffic being um, the number one limiting factor for this building. And I would actually argue, and we've had multiple conversations with uh, the airline that services Lethbridge, that it is absolutely on a supply and demand curve, and so there's oper there's multiple opportunities for WestJet to increase their frequency, um, or excuse me, I should say the volume before the frequency, to get more delegates into the community and ultimately get all of you out to wherever you'd like to go.
All right. So I sort of touched on this, but I will touch on some of the historical elements and where we are today. So if you drive by, the building looks about 90% finished. There's some siding that's being done in the process right now. In process right now, as I drove out of the site, they're painting the exterior concrete walls. Um, but some of what you can see is you can see the exposed wood on the far left of the screen. And so that is actually structural timber. And what we wanted to do there is actually bring Henderson Park into the building and vice versa. And so I, th I think the last time I, I spoke with SACPA, we talked about the fact that we'd have to take down all the trees from the old campground. So in fact, we took down 225 trees that were originally planted for the World Dry Farming Congress that I talked about before. But what we've been able to do with that is we've been able to commit 225 trees that we'll replant on site as part of our landscaping. We've also been able to uh, harvest 10,000 board feet out of those trees that we, that we took down. And we've, we've recycled them into all of our boardroom tables will be made out of the trees from site. All of our public seating will be made from the trees on site. So it's about seating for 200 people in our, in our main gathering area. Plus, um, I'm gonna jump off the microphone, so I'll explain it first, then I'll point. You'll see the main feature stair in the second picture from the right. Here. Those stair treads, that open tread design, those stair treads are also made out of wood that was recycled from our site. If anyone remembers the old 4-H gazebo that was on site in Pioneer Park, that's actually what those stair treads are being made of. So we have upcycled a lot of that. Every element of wood that we took out of the site was recycled in some way and given back to this community, whether with um, Cub Scouts selling it as firewood, we donated all the mulch that we uh, turned trees that we couldn't sell for firewood or reuse uh, to the mountain bike park in the coolies. So the, all 225 of those trees were 100% recycled into this community. Thank you. That was Bev's idea, actually. Um, and, then, and then how many of you have been to some event in the South Pavilion, whether a KISS concert, a Remembrance Day ceremony, a rodeo, a shockingly low number. Okay, now there's some more hands, okay. Um, one thing we wanted to do is we wanted to bring a bit of that history from the South Pavilion because it has played such an important role in the, in the cultural fabric of this community. Um, and so what we did is we have a bench structure, permanent seated bench structure that goes throughout the facility in any of the open corridors. And in fact, we've brought those bleachers over. So all of those benches are made out of those bleachers. So you'll see even the numbering from the old bleachers all throughout the corridors of the building on those benches. And then last, last but not least, in sort of our, some of our historical uh, nods to the history of this community, on the far right-hand side of this picture, you see a brick wall. And so we've actually uh, recreated um, it's, it's meant to be a recreation, I should say, of the old bricks from the Lethbridge brick and tile that was here over 100 years ago. And so we actually took a brick from Councillor Croson's desk uh, and matched best we could uh, to this brick. So it is meant to be a throwback to a lot of the historical buildings here downtown that were built out of brick um, at the turn of, of the 19th century. So how are we making an impact today? Um, Lethbridge and District Exhibition, as I said, for over 100 years has been a community gathering place. And I think a lot, we, we talk about how this building is about attracting new people to the community. But one of the things um, we want to make sure everyone still understands is that it is a community gathering place. We, we've, we've taken a lot of time and attention to, to ensure that there's physical community gathering places in there. We've built a pricing strategy for local community and charitable groups so that, so that they can afford to use the facility. Um, but more importantly, we want to bring people together uh, in celebration. And so our main three events are that. We have Ag Expo, which happens in March or February every year, uh, brings a large chunk of the agricultural industry here in Southern Alberta together for trade. And we're going to start, we're going to start recording the economic impact of that event that it had on the region and on, on uh, the community into the future. Um, our farmer's market 
our farmers market i'm sure some of you attend on saturday mornings or downtown on wednesdays it is actually the largest attended event we have on site and it's a free event for people to come and it's such an important for, event for this community and i will also remind you that it's starting next saturday in the north pavilion uh, and then last but not least Really, our identity for, the, for a big chunk of our 126 years has been tied to the fair. Like egg societies across the country, identities are tied to the fair. And I think if you asked kind of one in five people in the community about Lethbridge and District Exhibition, they would talk about Whoop Up Days and the history it has in this community or the memories you have as children on the Ferris wheel. Uh, Whoop Up Days really is a community celebration. It's a culmination of summer. And it's something that you, it, and it's that, that owed to the past. And so this year we wanted to make it accessible to everyone. And Whoop Up Days will be free admission this year because we want everyone to be able to celebrate Whoop Up Days differently than they have before and give this back to the community. It's less about Lethbridge and District Exhibition and it's more about how does the community come together. And so that's why we've gone to the free admission model and we hope to see you all out again on the Ferris wheel. And that's all I have. That's an update on us as an organization, our construction, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Come back. Thank you, Mike. Um, so I think everybody knows the process. If you have questions, um, I think you're to line up over here and um, then just come up and, and ask your questions. I, I know Mike has a lot more to talk about, so. Um. Uh-oh, first one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mike. <clears throat> it was fun. We worked together on a rotary project a few years ago for our rotary scholars, so that was very nice. And of course, I know Bev through rotary as well. Um, my name is Bev Mundell-Atherstone, and Bev and I are twins, Bev and Bev. So uh, I just want to remind you about Sakpa's AGM on the uh, 15th, June 15th, with Dwayne Brad. Um, Lori didn't tell you the topic, which I'm sure all of you would be very interested in. What did the results of the May 29th provincial election tell us about Albertans following the AGM? Okay, my question for Mike comes out of the usage of the old exhibition buildings. And we've heard in the newspaper about city council coming up with the idea of using it as a sports, sports arenas, um, extension of sports for people in Alberta. Um, I have two ideas. One I just mentioned to you, and that was the idea of building some of those buildings into low-rent apartments. And then listening to your talk and the limitation on the uh, amount of people you can actually have coming to the exhibition park, to the new exhibition park, being the amount of hotel space in Lethbridge, what about build, um, mod, up, up, um, grading those buildings in two hotels. So there's two ideas. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bev. It was great seeing you again. Um, I'll address the first one, which is in the news, at Councillor Parker's motion that I, I believe passed unanimously on, on Tuesday at Council. Um, and I guess the bottom line for us as an organization is we support the any use of those facilities that would greater the community good. And so uh, Councillor Parker actually approached us and asked us that before the motion went forward. And, and the reality is there's a significant opportunity uh, to serve the community in different ways than, that doesn't necessarily fit within our mandate as an egg society. And so if the, if the community as a whole has a different uh, opportunity for that space, we would certainly support the exploration of that and ultimately the usage of that. Um, whether that, that be uh, affordable housing, like you mentioned to me um, before, uh, or uh, recreation facilities, uh, we would certainly support that. We're, we, I will also say, though, that we're just, it's outside of our mandate and we're certainly not experts on those things. Um, and then on the second piece about hotel rooms, um, I, 
I like the creativity in that um, because uh, it is certainly a need for us. It's, it's wh where we've addressed uh, where the ceiling is in the facility um, to really see the full potential of what this facility can bring to Southern Alberta. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's any secret, so I'll say it. We're also actively uh, looking for hotel investment to build hotels on site as well. A marriage of mine. There you go. <laughs> Where should I stand? Leona Jacobs. Um, so my question has to do with um, great intentions on this project, but my um, question has to do with the unintended consequences of it. And so you talk that you have a, a structuring for um, local organizations that currently use your yeah. facility. And maybe you could talk a bit more about how that is being structured so that you can accommodate some regional um, events that have traditionally taken place over there. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I, maybe I'll go back to something I said before. Our, our focus is uh, attracting new, new economic impact and new visitor economy to Lethbridge. However, it doesn't mean we're turning our back on the events that have traditionally happened at Lethbridge Industry Exhibition. In fact, quite the opposite. Um, we do encourage more, um, more usage from the community. In fact, we're building out programming and elements of programming that would encourage more use. And so we do have uh, a discounted fee structure for um, community groups, charities, not-for-profits um, that will allow for usage of the facility. We're, we've, we, uh, some of our traditional clients we're working on uh, very bespoke solutions to some of the financial challenges that um, of uh, that may come with it with a much different facility. One of the things that we hear often is that we've seen a price increase, and the reality is, we we have increased our prices. That's a fact. Um, but there's a reason for doing so. Uh, the expectation on our service level is significantly higher. We've partnered with an outside uh, food and beverage company to elevate the food and beverage experience in the building, uh, but also the federal government specifically invested in the audiovisual into this facility. They invested $3.5 million so that we would have the most sophisticated audiovisual system in a trade and convention space anywhere in the country. And so all that is included in the price. And so there isn't any uh, additional um, hits when you come to the new facility. Uh, we've looked to package all that together and then offer a discount to the community groups. I, does that answer your question? Okay. Sorry, sorry. We can chat after if, if there's if there's a more in depth piece. All right. All right. I'm ready for your question. It might not be the same one I mentioned. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Hello. My name is Knut Peterson. Uh, thanks very much for your talk, Mike. And I was at your at the last presentation when Rudy, I think, was the was the guy that gave the presentation in the saddle room back in the days. And you put on a meal for us, too. <laughs> hey, hey I, I thought I'd get a meal today. <laughs> That's just it. Uh, my question relates to the old buildings, and I disagree with Bev's suggestion at all altogether. I think uh, the amount of money that have to be spent on those buildings to, to make them into anything usable would be uh, a lot more than, than it would be worth. Uh, can you give us a little bit of an idea about the uh, cost of that you need to spend on those buildings just to just to if they were to function the way they are now? Uh, never mind building them into anything else. Yeah, that's. Uh, thank you, Ken. You told me you'd give me some softball questions. But that's obviously top of mind for us. And so um, in our development, I guess to step back from that a minute, and um, I think what we've seen in the paper in the past few days is that there's, there's been an alternative use come forward. And where um, we were coming from in the past is for, for our intended purpose and our mandate, as I, as I chatted to your question, Bev, um, 
there's a there's a number of parking spots we need and i think everyone in here has been impacted trying to come to lethbridge and district exhibition at some point in time dealing with parking it's a major question and something we're trying to solve and so for our intended purpose um, our original development permit was to uh, take those buildings down and, and increase the amount of parking but also potentially increase other opportunities on site like the hotel i mentioned now uh, to your question um, I don't have that exact dollar figure today, um, but I know that it's in eight digits to get those buildings up to working order. Um, and, it, uh, and, and so it's one up, up to working order. Um, now to, to take them down, we believe, will be a similar price tag. Um, there is a lot of, based on the era of when those buildings are built, there's a lot of challenges with, with both uh, renovation as well as, as deconstruction. And so we're, we're examining what that looks like right now. We're working with the city of Lethbridge on that. Uh, but in the meantime, if there is uh, a short-term solution to mitigate some of that cost and tax burden to the community, that's what we're willing to support and that's what we're willing to, um, uh, to endorse. Um, but your point is, is well taken, is that uh, we're also looking to advise as best we can on the challenges that exist with those existing facilities uh, and, and finding the best path forward um, with, the, with the city for the community. Um, my name is Graham Greenlee. Mike, uh, my burning question, which I know will be very easy for you to answer. <laughs> what is the purpose of the humongous big hole that exists between the new building and the grandstand? Thank you. All right, I think that's the second highest volume question I get. So, assuming everyone's been by our building, there is a big hole to the south of the building. And so, a couple things. Uh, if you had ever been to the old campground at Henderson Lake, you may remember that it was a big bowl itself, and the camping spots were down in the bowl. And so the purpose of that campground being a bowl was for stormwater retention. And so uh, that was, and that was set that way uh, probably almost 100 years ago. Um, and when, when we established the location for the new building, uh, we actually, instead of excavating, which we did very little of, we actually infilled that site by, over, by more than 15 feet in some areas uh, so that we could set the elevation of the building so the lake was the key design element. What that meant is we had to move the storm retention. And so by code, we have to, have, we have to be able to store enough water on site for a one in 100 year event. And so what we, what we actually did was we negotiated for a one in one, and so a one in 100 year event. That means your time is up, keep going. Oh. Uh, in a, the one in 100 year event, we actually negotiated down to a one in 150. If you've ever seen the storm retention ponds in the industrial park here in Lethbridge, they're steep edged with uh, barbed wire fences around them so no one can get into them or, or cause themselves harm. But a one in 50 can be a much more gradual side. Um, and so we negotiated a, a, a release rate into the city system, uh, into the Lakeview neighborhood, um, so that we only have to retain a one in 150 year, one in 50 year event on site. And so that will actually uh, start being landscaped next week. Um, it will be entirely sodded and irrigated and it will actually serve as a community amphitheater um, and entertainment space for anywhere between 7,500 and 10,000 people. I'm uh, Mike Jakubowski, and I'm representing the Southern Alberta Classic Entity Car Club. And I got a concern about our swap meet costs there. Eh? Uh, our Friday setup, Dave, in the old buildings was $450 per building. Now it's $1,950. How do you justify such a large increase in price? Our tables and chairs. Our tables were uh, $3.85 for plastic tables. Now they're $10.50. Our chairs were $1.60. Now they're $2.10.
how do you justify such hard, large cost in increasing of the a rental uh, for our uh, executives to have a swap meet meeting was $200. Now it's $513. We can't see how you can justify such large increase in prices. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk to the move-in days on the Friday, I think you mentioned first. Um, and so one of the things that we have traditionally done is actually undervalue our move-in days because we haven't had the volume of events in the building uh, to, to warrant the, the need to uh, incre in, increase that rate. Um, and so very specifically, uh, we, we actually adjusted that to industry standard of, of half of an actual day. And that's, um, that's to encourage, not necessarily for, for your event, but for events as a whole, to take shorter time to move in so we can turn the building over more times and bring more uh, volume of events into the community. Um, and so that's specifically on that piece. Um, on the, the chattel questions around the meeting rooms and um, I guess the meeting room piece I, uh, I'll speak to first. And so there should be a discount factored into that if you're a registered charity or not for profit, which I believe the car club is. Um, so we can have a conversation about that because there should be a discount there um, that's available. And then the other piece is um, that all the amenity that's in that room that is different than what we had in the existing pavilion that's included in that rental price. Whereas before, uh, it would be a room charge plus an AV charge to use the mic and, um, and screen, et cetera. All that's included today. Um, and then there was also a bit of adjustment uh, to market rates on a, square, on a by square footage basis here in the community as well. Um, on, the, on the chairs and tables and things like that, depending on the use of the, the space, uh, those are also included in the room now. Um, and for your particular event, it wouldn't be because uh, it, it, but um, quite frankly, uh, compared to market standard here in Lethbridge, as well as through the province, we were significantly undervalued on, on, uh, on those elements. Now, um, be happy to have a conversation offline about that further, but that, that's where that justification came from. Hi, Mike Henning Mundell. Ah, good to see you. Yeah, um, my question is uh, it probably predates your involvement here, but there was a time when there was very active discussion, negotiation, conceptualization of moving a whole new thing to the southeast of town. And then there was a time when that flopped and it then came back in. So what were the various reasons for that and that? And it seemed to, what you're doing now seemed to be, to me, as a uh, naive observer, uh, the most logical. Yeah. And so I can speak to that to the best of my knowledge. And, and uh, I think Bev was actually around um, in the early parts of her time on the board when this was happening. And so probably what, so this project dates back all the way to 2002. Um, so it's more than a 20 year uh, conversation that's been going on. And I want to say about halfway through that, there was an evaluation done on five different sites. Uh, two, two potential locations on our site, so where we ultimately decided, and then um, where the east portion of the racetrack is, so facing 43rd. Uh, the site that you mentioned in the southeast, a site on the north side, and then actually a site on the west side as well. And so all those were evaluated in partnership with the city and some of the various stakeholders in the group. Uh, and at, throughout that, through that process, there was actually a purchase of land that Lethbridge and District Exhibition made on the south end. Um, the challenge with that piece of land is that it was in the 50-year outlook uh, for the city to actually get uh, services to and utilities to. And so the cost of infrastructure to get to that site, um, I'm going to be off on this, but I want to say it was over $30 million. It was a, it was a significant um, burden on the taxpayer just to put the infrastructure there. Um, 
And then as that study concluded, the site that we're on actually was deemed the best location. Um, that being said, the, um, there is limitations to our site. There, there, there isn't a lot of future growth capacity in it. Um, but what, what we deemed as, and this again to your point was before me, uh, is that we could have significant growth on the site we're in. Um, just not necessarily as big as the 155 acres that was purchased in the in the south half of the land. Now, moving, move, excuse me, the south uh, east corner of the city, and it was the very southeast parcel of the city. Um, and so, uh, in my time, since I've been here, we actually uh, evaluated that property and what it meant for us, and it was part of. Uh, the negotiation with the city actually on the funding of our facility that we're building now is we actually gave them back that piece of land. So we no longer have that piece of land. Uh, that was part of the, the motion ultimately, that they now have that in their land bank, I believe. Um, and, and we, in return for that, uh, received some, a little bit of debt relief on a short-term loan we had taken from the city as well as um, got our grant funding to build this building. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. There's nobody else. Yeah. Hello, my Knut Peterson again. Um, my question relates to the uh, grandstand, the horse racing, the relationship with, uh, Mount, you know, the uh, racetrack, Max Gibb, Rose. How how do, how is that all fit together with with the the exhibition? Uh, do do you have a formal relationship with them, or how does all how does all that work? Yeah. And what's the future of horse racing? Well. <laughs> Like I said, you told me you'd throw me softballs, and I think if I knew the answer to the future of horse racing, I wouldn't be in the position I was in. That's a million dollar question, I think. Um, but uh, I'm, I'll give the whole story of our site. So the, the city owns the, the 72 acres that we sit on and the Rocky Mountain Turf Club sit on. We lease the entire 72 acres from them. We have a 50 plus a 50 year option on that lease. Um, so I will say when we wrote the contract to go to 2121, it was a little bit uh, unnerving uh, to sign something like that. But um, and then Rocky Mountain Turf Club subleases the bottom 32 and a half acres of that. No, sorry, I, I call it the bottom, the south, kind of on a diagonal line through our site, 32 and a half acres of the site, and so um, they do have a formal lease with us. We get X number of dates a year, and so uh, Street Wheelers Weekend is, is some of our dates that we uh, use at the facility, as well as the Lethbridge and District Pro Rodeo, which happens in August in conjunction with Whoop Up Days. Um, so those are some of our usage days. They currently have a lease that goes until the end of 2024 with an option to extend that through 2029. But what I will say about Max Rose, Dot, and the entire team over there is that they have been phenomenal partners and it actually is, it, uh, we're actually very privileged to have such great partners working with us on site. <coughs> <laughs> so well, I, I may have two questions here. Um, the, oh, Carol Sakia. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hi. Uh, heating and cooling. I have not been following this other than I know things got demolished and then there was suddenly a bunch of steel up there and now there's glass up there. And so I'm kind of out of the loop, but I tried to go to the farmer's market last weekend and it wasn't there. <laughs> but I want to know if you're using, if you're able to use, based on money, uh, like the top heating, cooling systems available considering the environment. Yeah. Okay, and uh, my other question was about entertainment. So you've got all this millions of dollars of AV um, so can you bring in a band, an entertainer? Is there like a stage there where 500 people or 1,000 people could sit and be entertained? Are you gonna 
um, what do you call it, challenge the Yates and the NMAX? Can you give me some of that? Sure. Okay. So let's talk about heating and cooling first. Um, so I actually had our conversation with our engineers yesterday, and we believe when this building opens, it will be one of the most advanced from a heating and cooling perspective that exists in Southern Alberta. And so obviously we have a lot of west-facing glass that you spoke about. Um, and so a couple of things, it is, it is pretty significantly tinted to, to avoid some of the heat load that we get late in uh, this year in May days, but normally in July and August. Uh, and then the HVAC system is capable that even at full load of our building, which is over 7,000 people, um, that the system won't allow the building to get any hotter than 24 degrees. And so we'd have a two degree temperature swing, um, to, excuse me, a two degree temperature increase in. Uh, what I will also say is our existing pavilions, to Knud's earlier point, is um, they are probably the least sophisticated from a heating and cooling uh, perspective in the community. So we're seeing a lot of efficiency gain going from the old pavilions to the new Agri Food Hub and Trade Center. Um, and so we, we're almost two and a half times the size, um, but our, our electricity bill, for example, um, is only expected to increase by less than 10%. Um, and so uh, one of the other unique aspects of this building is that we actually don't have any mechanical on the roof of this building and so we have exceptional efficiency in our ability to um, maintain our mechanical equipment because it's all in the building and so our so there's no penetrations there's nothing on the roof at this facility with the exception of the corridor that runs right along exhibition way on the west side and so the entire top of the uh, the building uh, is a blank canvas and so it does open up the opportunity uh, to offset some of that those uh, energy bills in the future um, <coughs> with things like photovoltaics and and other opportunities like that and then the other unique thing on the heating and cooling is the building is entirely hydronically heated and cooled so it's it's all heated with water um, and so our um, domestic hot water for example uh, actually heats the building as well and so all of the water in the facility is recycled through the heating and cooling system and not just um, domestic hot and cold water yeah oh I'm sorry the second piece was about entertainment uh, so I'll speak to the competition question first and so our intent uh, with every space that we have is to not compete um, with any other space, whether that's for a banquet, a trade show, an entertainment piece. So there's no intent to compete uh, with the Yates or the MMAX Center. However, we do have capability in our building to do so. Um, and so we actually, when we were designing the building, we have four trade halls, as I mentioned before. One of those trade halls, we worked with a firm out of Nashville to ensure that we had uh, the appropriate roof loading in that hall to be able to put on um, maybe not so much a concert, but a large scale speaker series or something like that. So we do have the availability to hang the PA system that would be required for one of those things um, or open up new avenues that don't currently exist in Lethbridge, uh, something like an electronic uh, music show, which you can't do in a, a stadium like setting with, um, with elevated seating. Uh, by code. Uh, so there is opportunity to bring different types of entertainment events into the community that don't currently exist, but there is no intent uh, to compete. And then to your piece about, and then the capacity for that could go all the way up to 7,000 people. I know you mentioned 500 to, uh, to 1,000, I think. Um, and then uh, the Lakeview Salon, which wasn't in any of the pictures, it's the elevated event space I spoke about earlier. Um, it actually has a pretty sophisticated sound system as well, and th that would be for uh, smaller scale uh, speakers or very intimate uh, performances. But ultimately, the, the main entertainment focus for us from our programming will be the, the, the bowl outside that I talked about, or what we're referring to as Festival Lawn. Thank you.
Uh, my name is Lori Schultz. Mike, thank you so much for this uh, presentation today, really giving us a, an overview of um, you know, what will be um, existing very, very quickly. We've heard so much about the project over time and you've been giving great updates all along and so thank you again. So my question is about parking yeah. and um, I know recently there was a decision with the NMAX to charge uh, for parking and I think that was a city decision but I'm, I'm curious as to whether um, people who are attending uh, functions, will there be or is there a plan to charge for parking uh, similar, uh, similarly, similarly as there is now in, in the NMAX? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so uh, parking is, all aspects of parking are, are a hot button subject for us and so uh, I would be, I'd be lying if I said we didn't look at, at what the financial model looked like for charge for parking. Um, but ultimately what, what we've come to, at least in the immediate future for the next three years for sure, um, and potentially beyond, is that um, the type, the event mix that we, is, actually let me back up before I say that point. Um, currently we charge for our two, uh, our two larger signature events, that's Ag Expo and Whoop Up Days. This year, as part of the free admission, we will not be charging for parking at Whoop Up Days, uh, and Ag Expo will look very different as well. Now, uh, shifting that, um, our event mix is not one that people want to pay for parking. Uh, where, who came for the farmer's market? You t came to try to come to the farmer's market. You don't want to come to the farmer's market to get your carrots and pay five bucks to park. You don't, you don't want to come to the auto swap and pay five bucks to park. And so it's, it's not the same as a short-term entertainment property like you may see at the, the MX Center. And I, and I am a pro, I'm a proponent of parking because it's an important way um, to recycle some of the amenities at public facilities like arenas and, and convention centers. And, and so I was actually a proponent of it, but understanding the burden it has on the consumer as well. And so uh, with, our, with our current asset, uh, event mix, excuse me, it doesn't make sense to charge you folks every Saturday five bucks. If we get to a place where 90% of our event mix is people coming from outside the community and it's not putting the burden on our local citizens, then we'll probably relook at that model. But in, in the immediate future and when this building opens and for community focused things, we won't charge for parking. That's it. I don't know. Mike, could you uh, tell us a little bit about Hate its hall, its role now and in the future. I understand that the uh, because it's is it designated as a historic place. Uh, I understand that the new building was built uh, according to the level of the heritage hall. They had to raise it up a little bit higher to make sure a uh, lower or whatever it was to accommodate the Heritage Hall. Uh, can you tell us the plans for the Heritage Hall? Uh, is there any immediate plans to replace it or tear it down? Uh, I mean, it, it, it's an old building and sooner or later some money is going to have to be spent. First of all, I feel like you have some inside information. But um, the, so Heritage Hall is an interesting piece. It sits right in the center of our site. It, although it doesn't have historic designation, it has historic um, meaning to a lot of people in the community. And so for those of you who, and because there's more than one Rotarian here, I'm gonna tell the whole story. So Heritage Hall was built uh, it opened in 1927 because the original pavilions were actually burnt down by one of the Rotary Clubs here in town. I won't mention which one. Um, there was only one. <laughs> <laughs> it was 22 when it burnt 22. down. Um, and so Heritage Hall has been around a long time. It's coming up on its 100th anniversary. Uh, to your point, it's an old building. It, uh, it lacks a lot of the modern amenity and code requirements. Uh, of a modern building and some of those things have been grandfathered in. Um, 
the challenge with Heritage Hall and our and so our plan is for Heritage Hall to stand to stay. Um, but to your point, there will need to be a capital plan that goes into Heritage Hall, and we don't have that today. Um, there's going to be a significant amount of capital that needs to go into Heritage Hall just to keep it as a standalone building because it doesn't have an east wall, for example, right now. It is uh, when they built the main pavilion in 1999 to connect all the pavilions, um, Heritage Hall has too much dependency on those buildings. So if those buildings do come down instead of being repurposed into something else, and that's a big if at this point, um, it will have to close for a, a, a substantial amount of time and a lot of capital be invested in it to make it a standalone building because uh, the washrooms, the kitchen facilities, just the structure of that east side of it isn't sound without the main pavilion standing there. So we're working through what those dollar figures are. Um, oh, and then the other piece is uh, the southeast corner of the new building uh, was designed with special fire rating and special retaining walls um, to not impact uh, Heritage Hall so that we could um, maintain it in the future as, as is our plan um, should, should the cost be something that our organization um, can take on. But that's a, that's, a, that's a longer term strategy, that's not an immediate strategy. Okay. Thank you all very much. I had a question. Oh, that's good. Okay. Like I have a question around money, because it's all about money. Um, and if you could maybe um, share the information and the celebration around um, the cost of the construction of the new building and where that is probably maybe going to land. Yeah, and so I actually don't get to tell this story as much as I would like. Um, I think everybody's aware of what COVID-19 did to the construction and the supply chain, and everyone's ordered something that's taken three times as long to arrive at your home. Um, and so we actually went to Stats Canada recently and tried to figure out what was, what, what was the burden on the construction industry through the time of COVID-19? And the average in the province of Alberta for construction projects um, in the 2021 construction year and the 2022 construction year were 9.3% uh, to 13.4% over budget. And so I'm not going to stand up here and say we haven't gone over budget because it, it has been an exceedingly hard uh, to build this project on the original budget, but I am very proud to say that we've maintained that overage to 5.7%, which is significantly lower than the provincial average for those two, for those two construction years, uh, and ultimately probably one of the more challenging construction windows in the last 50 to 100 years. Um, and so our total budget for this building is um, coming in just around $75 million, um, a little bit north of $75 million, excuse me. Um, and to put one thing in perspective is most projects in this community on a cost per square foot basis are somewhere between uh, 450 and $600 to build. Um, sort of an average house right now is between 250 to $300 per square foot to build. We're building this building, which will be a marquee amenity for the tourism industry in Southern Alberta. We're building it for $281 a square foot, so it's something we're exceptionally proud of, the value for dollar going into this building. Thank you. Thanks, Bev, for the question. What else do I have to do? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mike. Um, I want to say thank you also for bringing some of your team. I know that you have a lot to do, and I know that you're at work at 6.45 in the morning, and I know that you're texting me at 10.20 at night. So um, taking the time to be here, I want to say thank you on behalf of the group. Um, I know this is a lot of work, and thank you for your team to come out and say hello to everybody. And if anybody wants to meet with uh, Mike and his team afterwards, if they have a minute to stay, if you have any significant questions, I'm sure they'd be happy to, um, to answer anything. Um, Mike, last thing, I would ask you to come and just do a mini wrap-up. 
just encapsulate, encapsulate what you said. Um, and then I think I can excuse everyone. Is that right? Did I get that? I, I, I feel like the timer went twice and I took other agenda items, so I apologize. Um, I think what's, if I could leave you with one thing, um, when you leave here today, thinking about Lethbridge and District Exhibition is, I think there, I believe that we have, there's, a, there's an established perception in the community about what Lethbridge and District Exhibition does or has done over the past 20 to 50 years. And the reality is when you walk into this facility, we expect that your expectation level on us has significantly changed. We expect that you, that you expect world-class amenities because Lethbridge deserves that. We expect that you expect to be able to have the world-class experience that you have in Vancouver and Toronto and Montreal and Calgary and Edmonton right here at home. And this entire thing is about elevating the visitor experience from the local community, but also from the provincial, the national, uh, and the international guests coming to Lethbridge because now we have a world-class amenity uh, to be able to showcase what all of us are so proud of in this community. So thank you very much. Appreciate the time.